My honor now is to introduce you to the moderator, Sandy Levinson, who is a professor of law at the University of Texas. His bio is in the back of your program. He's had a very distinguished life of letters and law, and we're very pleased to have him to moderate this session. Sandy. Not half so pleased as I am to be here. Um, I think among the people at the um, Aspen Institute tied for first among the people who do not need an introduction are uh, former Associate Justice Sandra Day O'Connor and Justice Stephen Breyer. Uh, I do want to add one item uh, of their respective biographies, though appropriate to the general theme of uh, selecting judges because both Justice O'Connor and Justice Breyer have actually been selected twice. Justice O'Connor, I think, was among the very last elected judges in Arizona, if I remember correctly, and then, of course, was selected by President Reagan to join the United States Supreme Court. Uh, Justice Breyer, uh, for many years, was a very distinguished member of the First Circuit Court of Appeals in Boston, appointed that office by President Carter, and I think I'm correct in saying that he was the very last person not, uh, confirmed during <laughs> <laughs> the Carter administration. Uh, and so I do hope and assume that we'll talk about uh, judicial selection beyond the topic of the hour, almost literally, judicial selection uh, for the United States Supreme Court. Uh, and I take it that uh, Professor Din does not take it amiss when I suggest that he might need a modicum more <laughs> introduction uh, than Justices Bryan and Justice O'Connor. Uh, Viet Din uh, is now, among other things, a very distinguished professor of law at Georgetown University. For purposes of this panel, probably he is uh, the most relevant item on his resume is that he was an assistant attorney general um, in the first term of the George W. Bush administration for legal policy. Uh, and by rumor, hearsay, and innuendo, it was suggested among a lot of people that he was very key in selecting judges. Uh, not for the United States Supreme Court, because among other things, uh, President Bush didn't get any appointments to the US Supreme Court during that term. Uh, but I suspect uh, that Professor Din might have weighed in on occasion uh, as to district and even circuit court appointments with regard to what the Bush administration had in mind uh, with nominating people to these lifetime positions. In any case, I am thrilled to be here. Uh, we will proceed in the order that people are, are seated. Uh, Justice O'Connor uh, will begin, followed by Justice Breyer, and then Professor Din uh, will conclude. Well, what do you want us to start with? Uh, anything you would like to say about uh, the process of judicial appointment, just selection, either at uh, state courts where most states, especially as you move west of the Mississippi, elect judges. I know that you have very strong views about uh, judicial election rather than appointment. Um, or the, uh, the selection process of the United States Supreme Court. Right? All right. Well, I think we're seeing the selection process work itself out again as we speak. We have a vacancy on the Supreme Court with the uh, retirement of Justice David Souter and the selection of his replacement. And I understand that about July 13th, uh, the hearings will begin for Judge Sotomayor. And that's always an educational experience for the country. Once a justice is confirmed and on the bench, you don't see a lot of them, certainly not much on television, because we don't have cameras in the Supreme Court room at this point, <laughs> and you won't see them. In fact, my own, uh, when I took the oath of office at the U.S. Supreme Court, I took it in the Supreme Court chambers, and the President and Mrs. Reagan were in attendance. I think that's the last time that the ceremony has been conducted there, because presidents like to have it on television. So they bring them to the White House and have all the TV cameras. So I think I was the last one uh, sworn in at the court. The selection process normally includes some input from the Attorney General to the president by way of the selection. I know that uh, William French Smith was the attorney general when I was selected, and he told me 
that because President Reagan had indicated during his campaign that if he had a chance, he'd like to put a qualified woman on the Supreme Court. And Attorney General Smith began collecting a few names. Well, his list was pretty short because there weren't many women judges and there were even fewer Republican women judges. So his list was pretty short. He kept it under his telephone at the Department of Justice. <laughs> and sure enough, there was a vacancy and William French Smith put out his pitiful little list and there I was. So uh, I ended up on the court. But, well, and I think President Reagan was very fond of horses and ranch life and so forth. So my own ranch background sort of appealed to President Reagan, I suspect. Now, I don't know, but I would think possibly so. Anyway, the selection process is largely behind closed doors. But the um, confirmation process, because the Constitution says the president shall nominate with the advice and consent of the Senate. So the Senate gets into the act, and it was most of our court's history, the Senate did not summon the nominee for questioning. That began, I think, with Felix Frankfurter's nomination, and he was asked to come over. And Well, anyway, it continued, and now it is this grilling process with gavel-to-gavel -gavel television coverage, and it's the only chance the nation has to see the nominee in action, so to speak. It can be a learning process. I think when Chief Justice John Roberts' hearing was conducted, we all watched in amazement. He was very articulate and knowledgeable, and we learned a lot from that process. Now, our states have the choice of how to nominate judges and select them. It was President Andrew Jackson who persuaded some states, starting in Georgia, to elect their judges instead of appoint them by the governor with some kind of confirmation process. It was Andrew Jackson was a real populist, and a lot of states fell for his line and started <laughs> electing judges and still do. There are some form of election, a, a number of them just retention elections in 30 some states today out of 50. At least 20 some states have partisan election of judges involving campaign contributions, mean television ads, and the whole ball of wax. And it is a very unfortunate way of selecting judges. I am biased on this subject so you will hear it in my remarks. I do not think that's a healthy way to select judges. We'll have more to say about that later, because I don't want to take up too much time. That's right. <laughs> well, I'll pick up just where you left off. OK. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think probably one of the problems that we uh, both see, which uh, is a problem, uh, is the problem of campaign contributions in uh, uh, state uh, elections for judges. Mm -hmm. So, well, what sort of problem is it? I, my student, Tom Phillips, uh, when I was teaching years ago, went on to become Chief Justice of Texas, and he told me he had to raise $4 million. Well, that was about several, many years ago, quite a few years ago, and it's a lot more, a lot more uh, now. And uh, uh, it change, and not for the better. Well, why? Why is it bad? I said, well, do you think you can get a fair trial? Uh, before the lawyer uh, and the judge, when lawyer A is given $100,000 to uh, this particular judge, uh, or somebody he represents does, I mean, that is a problem. And uh, we heard, I thought, very interesting at your conference, Sandra, the conference we had was uh, a judge from Texas who's a trial lawyer who does not like this system. And he said, uh, he asks uh, the other lawyers, well, why do you contribute all this money or your clients contribute the money? He says, well, they tell me that it doesn't really matter. The judge can be fair, and he tries to be fair. And uh, it's a question of perception. We agree with that, but it isn't the reality. So then he asked him this question. He said, so what you do is you pick which candidate you think is the best, and you give them the money. And they say, no, we give both candidates the money. Oh, he says, and why? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Exactly. So uh, anyway, the perception problem at least is a serious problem. We had a case this term where the court ventured very delicately into this area. 
And uh, the question was this, uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, a judge uh, received $3 million uh, from one individual with the corporation, and the three million didn't all go to him. A little bit of it went to him, but most of it went to a PAC, which was against his opponent. So it was in support of him. And then he sat on the case involving this particular corporation. And the question was whether the due process clause of the Constitution, which says you shall not deprive anyone of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, whether that was violated when the judge sat on the case where he had received this rather large amount of money uh, uh, from, uh, directly or indirectly, uh, from a party to the case. And we held five to four that uh, it did violate the clause. And he could not sit on the case having received that amount of money, directly or indirectly. But the four who dissented came up with some pretty good questions. Mm -hmm. They said to the five, well, how are you going to administer this? How is it going to work out in detail? I mean, after all, a lot of people have influence on the selection of judges. How are you going to do it? And the response of the majority was, we're not in charge. We simply trace the outer bounds. And we can say this went beyond the outer bound. But within that boundary, there's an enormous amount to be done. And the people who will do it, who we believe should do it, are the states, the bar associations, the state legislatures, the state courts, and all kinds of rules and regulations can be produced that limit or eliminate this kind of problem. We can't do it. Now you can say, well, why is it that important? After all, life is filled with problems. And when judges start talking about their problems, the lawyers all nod as if it were very serious because they want the judge to think that they're being taken seriously. <laughs> but as soon as they get out of the room, they say, you know, everyone has problems and judges fewer than most. So why is this such a problem? Well, I would say the answer as to why faces me and did face Sandra and still does in the courts every single day. We see in front of us every day in that court where I am sitting, every person you can imagine, every race, every religion, every point of view, and this is a country of 300 million people. And my mother used to say, we, she said, there's no view so crazy. There isn't somebody who doesn't hold it in the United States. And we were in San Francisco. So she said, they all live in Los Angeles. But the, the, <laughs> but, but the point is, that's true. People do, in fact, have very, very different points of view. And they have decided to resolve their differences under law. And that is a kind of miracle that's taken us about 200 years or more to accomplish. And Andrew Jackson was the one who also said, when John Marshall made a decision that the Cherokee Indians were entitled to their land, he said, John Marshall's made his decision. Now let him enforce it. And what he did was he kicked the Indians out after the Supreme Court said it was their land. And ordered my ancestor, Winfield Scott, to drive them out. Really? Really. I didn't know you did Yes. That. Well, you've made up for it. OK. <laughs> <laughs> made him pretty unhappy, yeah. I can tell you All right, that. so now, do you see why? Uh, you start thinking of what will happen uh, if people do not have confidence in the fairness of the judiciary. And it isn't just the judge's problem. It's your problem and mine and everybody else's. So that's the, that's the sort of commercial yeah. message here. <laughs> Um, I won't pick up from where you left off because I cannot. Um, I'll be very brief because you do not, you do not come here to listen to me. Uh, I will just uh, begin and end with one simple observation about judicial selection. It is that the task of judging is quite interesting because ultimately judges are the guardians of our system of laws, and yet at the same time, they are subject to our system of laws. And so in the two years I was in office representing the Department of Justice, during which time when the president uh, nominated and the Senate confirmed about, about 200 judges, uh, and we made a list of about 30 justices uh, nominees or so for uh, anticipation of an eventual uh, uh, vacancy, the overriding criteria, the overriding question that we asked was, 
does this judge have the intellectual humility to interpret the law and yet still be subordinate to the law? And that's as straightforward as it gets. The federal constitution protects judicial independence. Independence to do what? To judge according to law, to protect minority legal rights against majoritarian uh, uh, encroachment, uh, and to govern, the to, to govern our country, to help guide our country according to the constitution, but not to act as platonic guardians of the public good. Independence from what? Political pressures? Partisan politics, uh, majoritarian impulses, all the reasons why Justice O'Connor and Justice uh, uh, Breyer decry state judicial elections, because it is all the reasons why we have judicial independence in the federal system. But judicial independence comes with it a certain cost. That is, the danger that a judge once in the robe will get what we, do, what we call robitis, which is the arrogance that comes with judicial office that will, act, that will uh, lead him or her to act outside the bounds of the law. And so what check are there in this democratic system to that kind of encroachment of the judicial power? Right? This type of intellectual humility, institutional respect for the role of judges is well exemplified by Justice O'Connor and Justice Breyer, even though they were nominated by different presidents, disagree on the, the fundamentally on the, uh, the matters of law, but both have that essential respect for the role of the judge. And that's all you can ask for in, a, the, 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 uh, in selecting the, the, a judge. I like, to, I like to analogize it to investing for the long term rather than speculating for the short term. In selecting judges, you want to be a Warren Buffett. You don't want to be an Ivan Bolsky. <laughs> because you can always ask a nominee what he or she would do in a particular case, in a particular uh, the controversial issue, or in even a particular the, uh, the, uh, the political movement. That's what you get. What you get in answer is short-term speculation. That doesn't give you the sense as to how good of an individual this is as a judge who appreciates his or her role in a democratic society and who has an intellectual and, uh, and philosophical framework to guide decision making in the long term. I will trade short term cases always for a long term vision of the appropriate role of the judge uh, in a democratic society. And that's why we have the system that we have, the built in bureaucratic tension between the president as the nominator and the Senate as the, uh, the, the uh, advisor and consensor uh, the, in the federal system. And you have this ongoing question at the state, uh, uh, state level, should we have elected judges or appointed judges, if appointed by whom? And if they are appointed, once they are appointed, either by election or by the, uh, merit selection, are there mechanisms whereby they can recall from office? How long should their tenure be? And for what purpose? Uh, for what reasons can they be removed from office? Those are all the same questions that at the state level, the framers struggle with and answer in our constitution, which is how do we go about selecting, confirming, and rewarding judges for acting like judges? Uh, that is to protect our rule of law and not to violate it. What the framers of the constitution did for federal judges was to say uh, the federal judge serves not for life, for good behavior. That means the judge can be removed by impeachment for high crimes and misdemeanors. We have not had a Supreme Court justice actually removed. Uh, proceedings were brought against Justice Chase, but at the end of the day, he wasn't removed. Uh, other federal judges have been, unfortunately, a few times. And um, the, con uh, the framers also provided you can't reduce the federal judge's salary during the so-called term of office. Now states all have limited terms of office for their judges. Um, it um, has been suggested by people from time to time that we ought to limit the terms of federal judges too. That would take an amendment to the Constitution and that's very hard to come by, I must say. So probably isn't going to happen. Uh, I want to pick up from your 
opening comment, what Viet was saying, um, with regard to quite literally the policy of juice selection, I am obviously from Texas. Um, uh, Tom Phillips is a friend, and certainly I am not here to defend the process of judicial selection in Texas. But there was a very interesting letter to the editor in the Austin American Statesman last week with regard to this issue, uh, defending judicial elections, basically because of what I might say is a fairly well-justified mistrust of Texas governors, and this is not a partisan point, <laughs> um, but of the way s the state political system runs. And the argument is that this letter writer would like to have some input. So with regard to Justice O'Connor's initial comments, you mentioned very forthrightly and candidly that all of the names on the Attorney General's list were Republicans. And I am wondering in looking around for the kind of selfless judges you describe, how many of them were Democrats as against Republicans, or now that we have an Obama administration, whether one expects any Republicans to make the list. I think the last cross-party appointment was President Eisenhower's of uh, William Brennan. Uh, Lewis Powell is complicated because he was a Southern Democrat still in the early 70s. Uh, but presidents pick members of their own party, certainly for the Supreme Court, certainly by and large for what the Constitution calls the inferior federal judiciary. So why, how do you answer the letter, you know, how do any of you answer the letter writer saying, look, what you elitists want to do is substitute an opaque form of politics for a transparent ah, form of that politics. That is so wrong because <laughs> under a merit selection system, which I helped design for my home state of Arizona, we set up a bipartisan commission of citizens to consider applications of people who want to be a judge. When there's a vacancy, they let anybody apply. Now, those applications and those records are open to the public. Everybody can find out who's applied, and you can weigh in. The hearings, when they interview these people, are open to the public. And they ask that the uh, person who wants to be considered file forms and answer questions. That also is open to the public. And the commission is not dominated by lawyers. There are a handful of lawyers on the commission. But uh, by and large, it's citizens, and they have to be of both political parties. Now, I don't see how you could get more open than that or more fair. And the commission has worked very well in making recommendations. And they have to give uh, at least three names and of both political parties to the governor. And we have had governors in Arizona, a Republican governor recently, who appointed a Democrat to the Supreme Court. Now, I think that's about as fair as you can get. So maybe Texans are different. I should know. I was born in Texas. But um, anyway, I think you can have very fair systems, and I wish more states would do it. I'd say this. I think that the letter writer has put his finger on something. And I think the reason that this kind of stuff got going in the first place and the reason that elections were brought in is that people did distrust yes. the political process of governor appointment right. more. Now, but those were somewhat different days. I, I like to think of Hugh Bounds this year. I think it was Jimmy Walker when he became mayor of New York, uh, running on the reform. Maybe it wasn't Walker. I can't remember who it was, but say it was Walker. He ran on the reform ticket, and his whole slogan was, I am my own man. That was his slogan. He got elected, and the press said, who are you going to appoint police chief? And he said, I don't know. The boys ain't told me yet. <laughs> so, I mean, that, 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 that was a different era. And, and the, the, the uh, maybe, maybe, but eras change. There's no perfect system by any means. That's why I was pretty careful to focus my remarks on the campaign contribution aspect of this. When I grew up in California, there was an elected system of a kind, but the governor would appoint to fill a vacancy and then there was a retention election, mm -hmm. and it was, there was rarely a contest. I mean, it just didn't happen. So it approximated an appointed system mm -hmm. with some public input. Mm -hmm. Missouri has a system like that. There are many different ways of skinning the cat.
But I think what we're afraid of now is that when you look at all ways, it's gone too far, uh, particularly with the campaign contributions. Now, I say that in a way in picking up on, on what Yet said, and, and also what you said, Sandy, very, very interesting. You start to, well, they're just appointing Republicans. Well, the Democrats just appoint Democrats. That tends to be true. I can't do much about that. And uh, what I think of is even my campaign contribution remarks is part, to me, of a bigger problem. And that bigger problem, if I'm asked, as I sometimes am, what is the biggest problem facing the judicial system, these are the words I use. It's not the campaign contributions, but the campaign contributions are a manifestation of it. It is that people more and more think of judges as junior league politicians. Mm -hmm. All of the messages that come to people tell them that. You try and think of how many cases you read about in a newspaper in our court that were not five to four and did not involve a major social issue, which happens to be about 5% or 10% when you have those two put together. How often do you read about any of the 30 to 40% of the cases that are unanimous? How often do you read a case, uh, an article about a judge that, like the articles 40 or 50 years ago, did not have in it Clinton appointee, mm -hmm. Reagan appointee, mm -hmm. in parenthesis afterwards. So the messages that the public gets are these are political people deciding things for political reasons. And that's so far from the truth. But it could become the truth that I find it a big problem. Now, you say, well, judges are human. There's no perfect system. But to talk about it in terms of politics is a distortion. And I use the word distortion and not falsity. But it is a serious distortion. And my problem is to go back to those people in front of me every day. And so it seems to me that there are many fronts that are necessary to use to attack this problem on so that those people who are in front of us every day will continue to have faith in a system that depends for its existence on their faith. The faith, as yet said, there is no way to predict how the judge will behave. It's internal. And you say, what are the rewards for a judge? Zero. I mean, no, even that's an exaggeration. But near zero. It's internal. It's not external. And not one of you knows, and there isn't one person in the United States who knows. When I just wrote a dissent, that, that there are some who know, about 10. And it depended heavily on reading of a record of 1,000 pages of what happened in the state of Arizona. And is it, was I true to that record? Was I honest in what I said? Well, I know. And maybe a few others know, but you don't. Nor does the New York Times. Nor does the people who pra praised it. Nor do the people who criticized it. A handful. And so I have to live with myself. But I live in a system which continuously, in reality, that's what I listen to, praises me for being honest. And they don't talk to me, but I hear them. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's building a certain kind of institution. And it takes years to build that institution, <laughs> decades. But we who work in it, that's our reward, to work in an institution like that. And there are hundreds, thousands of judges who are not on the Supreme Court of the United States, who don't get to talk to audiences, who don't have whatever mystique goes with that title. And they have to act every day exactly the same way and get the same kinds of rewards. Now, that's a little, uh, all right. Anyway, you see the point, and I want you to see why I worry about this erosion, uh, if it, and it's there, of confidence in the system. Mm -hmm. It is. Justice O'Connor, if I can turn to you again for a moment. You, I suspect you're tired of being, um, being reminded of your firstness. I'm interested in one of your lastnesses, and it might be because I went to the Stanford Law School. Okay, what's that? Uh, you are 
the last person confirmed to the United States Supreme Court who did not go to the Harvard or Yale Law School. <laughs> That's good. Do, I'm one of the best, too. Do you think that that is simply an interesting factoid, or does it say something about a perhaps too narrow casting of the net? I think that it is desirable for presidents of selecting Supreme Court justices to look beyond Harvard and Yale, if I may say so. But why? Excuse me. <laughs> he's, he's one of them. And uh, to look much more broadly, and not to require that the only people considered have are those who've served on the lower federal courts as a district or appellate court judge. I think some diversity of background and experience is a good idea on the U.S. Supreme Court. All nine of the justices at present are products of the U.S. Court of Appeals. And I guess most of them are Harvard and Yale, aren't they? Uh, yes. What about yes. Stanford? Well, it used to be Stanford now and then, <laughs> but that seems to have changed. Um, anyway, I think it's good to have some diversity out there. I agree. Well, one other question about diversity. The last sitting justice when, who at the time of his appointment was living west of the Appalachians was Anthony Kennedy. Um, now, Justice Breyer mentioned that he was born in California, but I think it's fair to say that when you were appointed, the story said you were from Cambridge, Massachusetts. They're you not know? always accurate. I grew up in San Francisco. <laughs> right. I'm um, very sorry I'm from San Francisco. You can say what they you, want. Do you think it would be a good idea if there were judges, from, more justices, from west of the Appalachians? And should President Obama be concerned about that kind of regional diversity when there is a next vacancy. I have to court. make one little remark about that. I can remember when Justice Byron White decided to retire from the court, and he was from Colorado. The, the Supreme Court during my years there had a number of cases involving water right issues and disputes between different Western states over water issues. Now believe me, if you live in the West and it's about water, it's important. And you would be amazed how justices who are just a product of east of the Mississippi do not understand water law out in the West. And this is kind of a specialized area. And I was very concerned when Byron White stepped down and because I could see the immediate effect of people on the court who just didn't understand those issues. So I'd love to see a few more from the West, to tell you the truth. Yeah. Uh, may I point out that I think Justice Breyer succeeded uh, Justice White? Do I remember that no, correctly? Justice, uh, Ginsburg. Uh, Justice Ginsburg. Justice yeah. Ginsburg, mm -hmm. who also presumably did not have much no, early hands-on experience no. with water law no. or with American Indian law, no. which is another right. important. Look, I'm from, Ca I'm from San Francisco. He's from California. I, don't, I, <laughs> I went okay. to high, Lowell okay. High School, and if you <laughs> yeah. want to know what has an effect upon a person in America, it's where you went to high school right. and at the time that was there. So, uh, no, he fits the qualifications. Uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, do you want to do you want to weigh in? No, no, no. All I can say is that Easterners can empathize yes. with Westerners. Um, uh, so empathy is um, important. Um, what about the confirmation process? Has it become too much of a quasi-ritualized either rite or circus, depending on your point of view, to be genuinely helpful either to the Senate Judiciary Committee and the senators who actually cast the votes or to the, I think, reasonably vast members of the public who will watch these confirmation ceremonies. Well, you were well, asking I, us? Yeah, yes. I'll tell you, yeah. uh, we were confirmed. Right. Uh, and <laughs> moreover, we were appointed. You get it? ED at the end. We did not appoint anyone, yeah. and we didn't vote to confirm anyone. So asking me, or I guess Sandra, about the 
uh, confirmation process is like asking uh, for the recipe for chicken a la king from the point of view of the chicken. Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, I'll, t I'll take a crack at being the chef, then, or at least a sous chef. <laughs> I worked in the Senate, and also the, uh, the, the primary part of my job was actually to guide uh, the nominees through the confirmation process, both in a Republican Senate and after the, the, uh, the switch, uh, after the midterm election in a Democratic uh, the, the Senate. Uh, and so it was a the, the, uh, very interesting experience. We had one rule, uh, and uh, probably goes to serve the, the, prove the point of your question. And the one rule is never take the bait. This is a kabuki dance, it's political theater. Don't take the bait. Mm -hmm. They'll ask you questions. There are ways to answer them. Don't lie, but just don't take the bait. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, take an example. Are you in favor of affirmative action? Right. Well, Senator, let me say categorically that discrimination is unconstitutional and illegal in our country. <laughs> you know, and making, uh, making judgment based on race is bad, uh, bad policy. That said, questions arise all the time as how we, we apply this, and I won't, uh, I won't know until the specific, uh, the specific uh, the facts. And you know, there'll be harsh questions about uh, personal finances, harsh questions about personal de demeanor and the like. It's just a ritual whereby if you can show that you have the temperament, the, the, uh, the ability to rise above it all, then I think you will be confirmed. Uh, but the, the, uh, the, if you do take the bait, then the, uh, that is a, the, uh, the doomed uh, the confirmation process. I can tell you uh, one thing about my own, which is not anybody else's, and I bet I bet this experience is shared. Uh, it's stressful. Oh, very. <laughs> right. I'm sitting there on one side of the table, and there's 17 senators on the other side. And uh, also, it's on television, and I'm not really used to that. And luckily, I was very boring, and people kept turning it off, which was <laughs> fabulous. But the, the, they will ask what they want to ask. They are the ones who are elected. I'm not. And if they ask things that too many people don't want them to ask, and they do that too often, someone else will be elected. So what I see this as is from a con and I hope I knew perfectly well if the people who are looking at those television images, if enough of them don't like what they see, I won't be confirmed. Now, I was, luckily, and I think people are pretty tolerant, to tell you the truth. I, I think Americans, when they look at such a thing, are interested. Yeah. They're trying to find out who is the person, will this man mm -hmm. or woman be yes. fair. Yes. I don't think they're being, maybe some are, but I, I have confidence in a sense that the vast majority are not looking at this ideologically. They want to know more or less what this person is. Now, I don't know that that's true, but that was my belief. Now, uh, if I, it had a happy ending for me. I was confirmed, but if it had, I had not been, I hope, not knowing, I would have had the maturity to think of it in this way, that this is a window of democratic input into the selection of a person who will go to a court from which he is almost impossible to have him removed. And yet that person will have a lot of authority and ability to make decisions that affect millions of Americans. Now, we don't want, for the reasons I've said, to have such a person, the judge, be easily removable. Because he or she is there to protect people from these swings of public opinion. But in the normal constitutional compromise, we have a way in a democratic system of having an input into this process leading to the selection of a person who is removed from democracy in the nature of the job. All right? That's not a terrible compromise. Now, if you don't like the system as it has evolved, or if you think that it's far too much in the direction of kabuki theater, then the solution to this is to explain this to people through the bar and the, and, and the other institutions of molding opinion in a democratic society. And believe me, if people begin to share that opinion, it will change. And if they don't, well, then it won't. And nothing I could say would make a difference. I suspect um, the senators love the 
Senate hearings on uh, Supreme Court justices because it's carried gavel to gavel on the television. Mm -hmm. And they sit there looking very erudite. They can get all dressed up and ask intelligent questions. And um, they love it. Think what they'd have to pay for that if they paid for it in normal circumstances. <laughs> so it's not going to change. Mm -hmm. Believe me, they just love it. And that's why the Senate never had public hearings in the years before television. This is a, a product of our TV age, I'm afraid. But uh, on the plus side, and there, there's very little on the plus side, <laughs> but on the plus side is that Americans get to see for themselves a little bit of the uh, character and presentation of the nominee. And that may be their only chance. They may never have another chance to see this person and listen to them talk and form an impression. So to that extent, I would think people would sort of like it. Now, and of course, we're talking about Supreme Court nominations. Yeah. I d very seriously doubt that any district court nomination or circuit court nominations have been covered on television. I think that's uh, right. Though, though they might be very illuminating. Uh, two other lasts before we turn to questions. I think that it, I am correct in saying that Justice O'Connor is the last person appointed to the Supreme Court who had run for elective office and mm -hmm. elected mm -hmm. to elective office. Right. Uh, you are, I think, majority leader in the Yeah, I was in Arizona the Arizona State Sen Senate, Senate. Senator. Uh, Senate. And Senate. you are the last person appointed to the Supreme Court from a state court. Mm -hmm. Justice Breyer, I know from his having visited, a uh, very wonderful visit, when I was teaching the Yale Law School three years ago, and, and Justice Breyer visited my class, um, you spoke in a notably and movingly heartfelt way about your service on Capitol Hill uh, as consul of the Senate Judiciary Committee. And I think that you are the last person appointed to the Supreme Court whose experience has been on Capitol Hill rather than the executive department. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. as we talk about various diversities, uh, whether it's regional, the school you happen to go to, would the court benefit from having a successor sometime to Justice O'Connor who would actually run for elective office and won elective office and actually experienced the problems of elective office? And would we benefit in the future from having somebody who had worked on the Hill rather than, say, in the Office of Legal Counsel or the Office of the Solicitor General, as distinguished as those offices are? Other things being equal, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I know, absolutely. I think, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think that's a, a reason why uh, Justice O'Connor is very much missed. Especially the Hill, because the Hill is a strange mm -hmm. creature. And also state legislation, you know, state capitals mm -hmm. are strange. If, mm -hmm. if you focus your, your study of American government basically as the institutions and never experienced Congress, I think you can study the presidency and you study the court without having experienced it. But I don't think anybody can sort of appreciate the Hill yeah. as, a, as a living institution. Is there any reason to think that Congress is stranger than the executive branch, which you served in? I mean, some you know, of us might say the executive branch in a number of ways is pretty strange. But people in the Department of Justice may just think, look more naturally to people in the executive branch as potential judges than people who have been in this crazy legislative world. Well, sure, but, but, but remember that the, the legislative, the lawmaking power of which the, the primary task of judges to interpret the law is in the legislature. And unless you, I think, unless you have a special appreciation for that process, you you may try to, to tend to be more formalistic in terms of uh, the, the of the view of the law and the legislative process rather than a, 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 a more the, uh, experienced view. I don't know which way it cuts, mm -hmm. you know, but the, uh, but the, uh, the, it may well be that the, uh, Otto von Bismarck is right that we shouldn't see how law or sausage is made. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, <laughs> it, it may well be that the, uh, that special the, that the, uh, insight which a lot of people have. Uh, the, 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 it may be useful. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we ought to turn now to uh, questions and comments from the audience. There are 
uh, some microphones, and if you would go to the microphone, and I'll call on you, and if you'd just please identify yourself before your question <coughs> or comment. Yes. Richard Gordon, Aspen. Justice Breyer, the, the West Virginia case, the West Virginia Supreme Court case is fascinating. You have a, a defendant company losing at the trial court, $50 million verdict, a huge verdict, and files an appeal. And during the course of the appeal, there's an election to the court that's gonna hear the appeal. And a, a man who is not on the court runs for a seat on the court and accepts $3 million from the defendants who are about to be heard by the court, which constitutes two-thirds of what the man got in his entire election campaign, goes to the court, sits on the court, hears the appeal, and votes in favor of his contributor. And somehow this is allowed to happen and actually gets to you. Where, where are the standards? Where, where are the process for recusal of this gentleman? Um, shouldn't there have been standards, and in a broader sense, the Supreme Court of the United States' own standards for recusal are notoriously unknown? Um, <laughs> shouldn't you lead a bit more on that? Well, we said, you know, as I said, we held it violated the Constitution, and uh, uh, the. But if your your point is that would it be important to have recusal standards in the states? Uh, and in the, uh, 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 say in that state, that, that have prevented it from getting uh, to us, well, that was my point. Yeah, there are all kinds of institutions designed to deal with it. As far as our recusal standards are concerned, we all file, follow the ABA uh, standards, or what, you know, the normal judicial recusal standards for a lower court. Every one of us follows that. Uh, the, so there's no secret. There's, there's no secret about it. And uh, the uh, standards are complicated and so forth. And there is one difference in the Supreme Court in respect to recusal than there is in a lower court. The difference in this, when I was on the Court of Appeals, and uh, I, I suppose I have a close question on recusal. I could, I could either recuse myself or not. Uh, I might as well recuse myself, frankly. Why go into it in depth? Because they can always get some other judge. See, and one judge really is good as another. So it doesn't matter. There are loads of judges they can get in to decide this case. In the present court, it makes a difference. It could well. Because there are nine of us. There's no way to get somebody in. I recuse myself. It's going to be four to four. And that means I have to, when there is a close question, really think about it. And then uh, if I think the duty to sit is greater than the reasons for recusal, I'll sit. And, and because you're not, they're not free just to decide everything to recuse. That's what makes it more complicated. But the standards are identical. And quite often, uh, when I'm having a tough time, there's nothing to prevent me consulting with some experts in legal ethics, which I sometimes do. And there's nothing to prevent me from talking to my colleagues about it, which I sometimes do. And all of us do that. And, and so I, I think it works out the same in the court, with the exception that I mentioned. Uh, and you might find it. You see, uh, you say, well, gee, this would have been the lower court. He just would have taken himself out of it. Yes, but maybe he thought, why not? And I don't have that luxury where I am now. Yes. Hi. Um, my name is Christine Balling uh, from Bogota, Colombia. Um, Watching all the coverage surrounding the current nominee, I must admit, as a laywoman, I've, I've been somewhat confused. Um, given the, I guess, dictionary definition of impartial, and uh, I guess the importance of, of a, a diverse uh, Supreme Court body, and, and you've, you've mentioned that today, with regard to that now infamous quote about um, the current nominee being perhaps a, a, a good choice given her particular uh, racial, uh, economic, and uh, gender background. I, I, I wonder if any of you would like to comment on whether or not, where, where you fall on, on that side of the debate, whether that, that's a good thing or, or a bad thing. I'll start so you yes, guys can I, warm up. I, I, I think, um, well, Aristotle started first, right? He says the rule of law is the rule of reason, 
-hmm. And what, you know, what is the rule of reason but the ability to convince another person uh, of your own state of knowledge? And so, and, and so we are in a sort of like unique culture in that we all uh, recognize and respect the individuality of personal experiences. And each one of us, you know, no matter where we come from, is individual in our experience. But we also recognize and respect the universality of knowledge. And so where the difficulty comes is, what does one mean by the word empathy? If by empathy, you simply uh, recognize that we are all individual, we all ca carry to the table individualized experiences, then fine. That's all part of being human and being understanding and our, our ability to understand each other and to reason through law across differences like that is exactly not only legitimate, but desirable in selecting a judge. But by personal experiences or specific empathy, you mean that there are certain barriers that one cannot cross intellectually in order to achieve the, a rule of reason and therefore the rule of law, then it seems to me uh, that would not be only illegitimate uh, but unjust in a, the, 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 in a system uh, the, of a democratic rule of law. Uh, and I know that we're all human. I know that the uh, judges are human too. I know that there's sin in the world, and God knows I've sinned from time to time, but that doesn't mean that we aspire to sin. And li likewise, uh, it seems to me that even though judges are the, uh, the human, and sometimes they the, are overcome by passions or prejudices or, the, uh, the, the, or whatever in order to, uh, and so that they the, uh, violate their oath of office to be impartial the, uh, to the rich and the poor, uh, we shouldn't aspire to it as a criteria. And I, you know, and I suspect, or actually I know because they've said this publicly, that neither President Obama nor uh, the Judge Sotomayor means empathy and personal experience in that negative, illegitimate, unjust uh, the sense of the word. And I guess that's what the, 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 the confirmation hearings will uh, end up uh, the, trying to illuminate. Uh, on Aristotle, just one moment. Aristotle also spoke about the importance of equity. And um, I clerk for a district judge who spoke quite often about the importance of an equitable consciousness as well as what he would sometimes refer to as blind rule following. And it does seem to me that you might be stacking the deck in favor of a very particular model of law and not being sufficiently sensitive to the importance of context and the human realities that will emerge in any given case. I mean, I think of the strip search case uh, that was decided last week where Justice Ginsburg spoke uh, quite candidly and quite publicly about the importance of being able to look at the world from the perspective of a 13-year-old girl who is being forced into a strip search. So, but know, seven of her justices agree with her. Yes, her colleagues agree with her. Right. Agree with her. So uh, the, the story cuts both ways, doesn't it? Uh, well, the, the question is, how, what would Aristotle have thought about the best way? <laughs> but back to questions. Yes, please. I believe she's next. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Okay, we'll go back and forth. Yes. Okay. Hi, my name is Richard Horvitz. I'm from Cleveland, Ohio. And I, I'm involved with the Board of Visitors at Duke Law School, where I served with Sandy for many years. One of the programs we have at Duke is a public law program to try to promote a public understanding of law and its relationship to society. And we have educational goals for the public. Uh, Justice Breyer made a very passionate and compelling case for or description of how a judge, what their mindset should be in deciding the case, how they should approach their duties in a non-selfish way. How do we get the message across to the public? so that they understand that when they see, hear these confirmation hearings, when they see judges, it isn't about winning or losing this specific parochial issue that may be of interest to them, but a process that's critical to our government. The Supreme Court is one of the few uh, institutions, I think, s still held in very high esteem by the American public. Can they be a help in this? Well, perhaps they're being a help today. I understand this is being televised. Maybe some Americans will watch it and understand a little better what the role of the courts really is and should be. 
And Sandra is spending an enormous amount of time on this, enormous. And, and it, it is it's such a good question because it's, it's, it, the, her answer and mine to this is there's, oh, as, as sort of uh, abstract and general and impossible as it sounds, the only way to do this is when someone is in the 11th grade of high school, by the end of that year, he or she understands the rudiments of how democratic government works. So she is at Sunnylands with the Annenberg Foundation and has Kathleen Jameson uh, working on films, uh, uh, explaining Supreme Court cases, and she'll explain it. And they're in 44,000 classrooms, and, which is fabulous. And, and then she has some other project going with, the, uh, with the, the teachers. It's such a big country that you at Duke on that board are a tiny but necessary part, and so are we. And what we've tried to do, and, and, and she has, uh, does it as much as anybody, if not more, is every chance you get, even if it drives people to distraction, <laughs> repeat what it is basically that we do. Repeat what it is to be a judge. Plead with people to go to their legislators and ask them to require civics. And over and over yes. and over. And then prepare materials so that the lawyers, and there are a million in this country, on law day can go to the judges and say, judge, it's all here, the questions and answers. I'd like you and me to go to the ninth grade in that high school over there on the 1st of May, and the lesson plan is here, and the teacher can just read it the night before, and there's a television film with it, and the kids will love it. Okay, that requires so much work on the part of so many people, but I think there just is no other way. I think this is my cue to mention Justice O'Connor's website, www.rcourse.com. Mm -hmm. Oh, dot org. I'm sorry, it's nonprofit. Well, it's also cue to mention one of the conversations that will follow this of Secretary of Education Duncan, because yes. one of the things that Justice O'Connor pointed out. Rather shockingly, I didn't realize this, but you pointed out in the speech that one presumably unanticipated consequence of No Child Left Behind was the uh, demise of civics education in the public schools. I think Chuck Close might mention the demise of arts education, but uh, my daughter teaches at the Harvard Graduate School of Education on civic education, and this is the topic that kind of obsesses her, that it is just vanishing. Yeah. from the American oh, school system. Really sad. Yes. Thank you. My name is Nikki Irvin, and I'm a proud resident of Los Angeles. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I love Los Angeles. <laughs> I love LA. Too. My question for the whole panel is uh, wonderfully segued by the prior discussion about uh, public service. And I'm really curious about tenure and your opinions on the tenure of Supreme Court justices. I believe that the European Union Court of Justice has a tenure of 15 years. And what Justice O'Connor is doing and has been doing over the past couple of days I think is wonderful. You're the first Supreme Court justice I've laid eyes on. And I've learned a lot about the court from you and, and uh, from you as well, Justice Breyer. And I, I wonder if it wouldn't be a win-win for our country if Supreme Court justices had a fixed tenure of say, 20 to 25 years after which you could go on tours like this. Well, and that's educate fine, our nation. except you'd have to change the Constitution. Have you tried to do that lately? <laughs> well, <laughs> it's tough. I know, the, I know the prospects are dim, and I sat they in are. on this, this morning's uh, constitutional <laughs> lecture with yeah. uh, Professor Levinson, and, and I know that that's, uh, you know that's a long shot, but you know, I, I believe that if there were a campaign, perhaps by the nine of you, uh, that this would be an engaging conversation for us because I, I, you know, as great as, as the greatest teachers and, and principals are, they're, you as examples of our judicial system, I think, are, are unparalleled. So well, an idea for the Aspen Well, to go ideas. about it, you know. Justices can step down. I did. <coughs> Justice right. Souter did. So right. maybe it'll take care of itself. That's great. You would have to have a, a longer term. I think if you say you had an 18-year term, as opposed to a life term, it would be fine. It would make no difference whatsoever. Right. You have to have a long term, as you've recognized. Mm -hmm. You don't get used to the job until three to five years. 
And, and it, does, it is a job where experience helps. But 18 years is a fine. Uh, but the problem is just what Justice O'Connor said. And, and, and I get very nervous when people want to find statutory gimmicks in order to try to get around the problem. Because th this is a, an area uh, where you have to think clearly and simply. So I, I would be very nervous of some gimmicky statute. And I would think the way to do it would be a uh, constitutional amendment. And there we are. I'll tell you an interesting story, which people know is a very, very old judge. When I think it was, was it, it was either Holmes, or I, think, I think it was supposed to be Holmes, but don't hold me to it. Uh, where the court said, now there's Judge Field, who's now awfully old. Yeah, it was Holmes. Was it? And we think, by the way, he's just lost it. <laughs> so <laughs> will you please go to tell him that it's about time for him to step down? So Holmes goes to see him in his house and apartment, and he's sitting there. And Holmes said, now, he said, do you remember Justice Field when you were first on the court? And the judges pointed out to you that Justice Greer had gotten along in years. <laughs> And he was having a hard time keeping track of these arguments. It was about time for him to retire. And they asked you to go to him and to explain that to him. And Field looked at him, and he said, yes. He says, I remember. And a dirtier day's work I've never done. <laughs> Uh, Mark Whitaker with NBC News in Washington, formerly of Newsweek magazine. Uh, Justice O'Connor, if I recall correctly, in your decision in the University of Michigan affirmative action case, you said that one of the reasons you thought that we still needed affirmative action in some form is that in order for our institutions to have legitimacy, they needed to reflect to some degree the diversity of the population. Um, do you think that also applies to the judiciary? And to what extent does it apply to the Supreme Court? Should it have any? Should that argument have any place in the debate over the current nominee? Um, and um. I think that it's helpful in our country that people can look at the Supreme Court bench and have some reason to think that it is somewhat reflective of our society with no women on it, I didn't think it was. With one woman on it, I thought that was a very small beginning. Um, we're getting another one, I think that helps. And we have a nominee who also is Hispanic, that probably will encourage Hispanics who live in this country. We have an African American on the bench and that probably is an encouragement to African Americans. So we're not totally bereft of some diversity on that bench at this point. I and think how, we can do better. And if, and if that is one factor, how do you weigh that factor against other factors that should go into the selection? Well, that's up to judges. the president and the Senate. They can weigh them. They're perfectly capable of that. You don't have to ask the Supreme Court justice. We're lucky to get there, I guess. <laughs> Quite right. But um, <laughs> I think that's one of the concerns that any president would have in selecting someone. Viet, when you were offering advice on potential nominees for the district or circuit courts, to what degree did diversity concerns of the kind just described mm. um, feed well, into your judgments? Right, a uh, different kind of uh, analysis than uh, uh, Michigan, obviously, because uh, judicial uh, the, uh, positions are not entitlements. As they, the, the, as they are in the educational the, uh, the, the, the processes. Uh, and the decision is not based on, uh, uh, it's, it's a political decision. Uh, it is for the president and for the Senate to, uh, to judge. That said, um, President Bush had this uh, rather, um, I guess opaque would be a, a good uh, description of it, uh, standard called affirmative access. And everybody keeps asking what is affirmative access and nobody can really articulate what affirmative access is because everybody knows what affirmative action is and uh, is not. Everybody knows what quotas is. Everybody knows what plus systems is. And, and nobody really articulated what affirmative access is. And I think the way it worked in practice for us is something like this. If we go into, as it has uh, uh, that happened, we go into the president and say we have this seat that is open in New Orleans. 
and here is the name of the candidate that the, the committee recommends. And it happens to be a white male. The president will lower his reading glasses and said, are you sure? We said, yes, this is what everybody has, uh, has agreed to. And he, said, and he starts asking the next question. Well, who did you look at? Who are the top three besides this guy? And if that, the, the, the top three turns out to be all white males also, they'll just say, go back, do your homework. And if we go back, another the, the, uh, the round go, uh, goes around, and we come back to the president, and the, the same or a the, uh, the similar name comes in, and he says, you ask the same question. I said, and by the way, we've gone back and done all of this stuff. And he says, fine. If this, the, the, uh, uh, if this is the, the, the best recommendation, then the, the, uh, I will trust you. But I want to make sure that you have not been tunnel visioned into uh, the, the, this decision because for you not to be able to find African American in a predominantly African American uh, the district uh, the, seems to me uh, an oddity. But, but those are the kinds of uh, uh, the questions that are asked in a very practical uh, manner. Yes. Uh, Charlie Firestone from the Aspen Institute Communications and Society Program. Uh, Justice O'Connor, you've done a tremendous job in making the importance of judiciary uh, an important issue for all of us in civic education. And the answer often for civic education is transparency. And so Justice Breyer, I would like to know why the Supreme Court does not make its arguments available to the public through televised uh, arguments. You mean the oral arguments? Oral arguments. They are available. It's just a question of when they're available. Why, why don't we have television in the courtroom? Well, we do have television in a lot of courtrooms. But oh, yeah, you do. I mean, so, so what, 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 why do we not have television in the Supreme Court to, to right. uh, have the oral argument? Because well, people, I guess, and most people there think the negatives outweigh the, uh, the positives at this moment. Uh, the negatives, the positives are obvious positives. The positive would be it would be quite educational for people to see. And I think what they discover in nine people who do their job in an institution that works pretty well. And they'd see that some of these issues that uh, they think are so obvious one way or the other are far from obvious. And uh, I'd like to think in that respect a very minor issue, but it turned out to be important about the term limits issue, whether that violated the Constitution. My goodness, that was an interesting argument. Because for every argument you had on one side, you had one on the other. Jefferson thought one thing in story, Madison and Hamilton the other. So there'd be a tremendous educational value. You say, well, well, why not do it? Well, there are arguments on the other side, and I can tell you what they are. I'm not necessarily endorsing one or the other. The arguments on the other side in the Supreme Court are, one, people would worry because of the symbolic value of the court, that the television would then be in every courtroom in the country, including all the criminal cases where you have concerns about witnesses and jurors and intimidation and so forth. The second argument that people sometimes make is that it wouldn't be understood very well that this oral argument's only 5% of what goes on. Most of it's in briefs. And the third, which is, re and people relate to human beings, as you know, and what our job requires is not to focus on those particular individuals in the cases. And that's probably the most important thing. The nature of our job is to worry about the 300 million people who will have to live under this rule of law, interpreted one way or the other. And those people are not in that courtroom. Rather, there are two lawyers and there's a plaintiff and a defendant. And people might, being people, as very nice quality about human beings, they focus on individuals. You meet somebody, you relate. You see him in a picture, you relate a little less. You see him and hear about him in a radio, still a little less. You still, news stories, still less. He's a statistic. You hardly can keep your eyes open. That is a characteristic of human beings. So there are concerns there. Now, which way those concerns balance out, I don't know. It hasn't really come up very much. People have different views on that, and I'm not going to express my own view one way or the other on this. But we're moving in a direction where more and more is on television and maybe people adapt to it more and more. But at the moment, that's all I can say about it. Any further no. questions? Um, no, I obviously haven't convinced you, but the, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to acquaint you with the arguments on the two sides. Well, oh, I forgot one which is important, psychologically. It's not a logical argument, but it is important psychologically. Every one of us, while you're there, 
while I'm there, not one of us thinks that we're doing at any minute what 99% of the people think we're doing, which is doing what we want. I think almost all the time I'm not. We're trustees. That's what we think of. We are trustees of an institution. And that institution has served America well in the past, OK, we hope in the present, and who knows about the future. And so some of us may think, if we were to vote for something with the implications of change we know not what, be careful. That's called being very conservative about working major changes on this institution. That's not a logical argument. It's a psychological argument. But I wouldn't understate its importance. The architect of the Supreme Court was a talented man named Cass Gilbert. One of the features he put in the court, in the courtyards to hold the beautiful lamps up, were tortoises. <laughs> now, why did he do that? It's because justice moves slowly. Mm -hmm. And why does justice move slowly? It's because it's better to be sure than sorry, okay? I think I speak for all of us in thanking <laughs> Justices O'Connor, Breyer, and Professor Dick. <laughs>